I'm going to talk about pediatric bone sarcomas today and the importance of diagnosis and treatment, especially the importance of a timely diagnosis uh, in the typical child with a bone tumor, which would typically be an osteosarcoma or a Ewing sarcoma. Um, the current uh, picture uh, here shows a uh, osteosarcoma of the lower femur, uh, which is a tumor that's very difficult to see on a plain x-ray. If you look at an MRI, it's a fairly dramatic picture of involvement of the lower femur. This tumor case next to it is a tumor of the upper arm or the shoulder. It's the second cousin of an osteosarcoma, the other uh, bone tumor that occurs in children called Ewing sarcoma. They are tumors that receive very, very similar treatment. They have a similar prognosis. Their prognosis was dramatically improved in the 70s and 80s with aggressive chemotherapy. They're a success story for chemotherapy in children uh, with malignancies because the prognosis for these children went from 30, 40, 50% to 60, 70, 80% with the uh, in onset of aggressive chemotherapy. Uh, the biology of these tumors and the pathology is made a diagnosis, the, uh, which is a biopsy. Biopsy is a critical uh, first step and recognizing the need for a biopsy is an even more important step. And I'm going to emphasize a little bit the importance of timing of treatment and what the challenges are with those, uh, with making that treatment on a timely basis. Uh, this is the other uh, important bone tumor, which is Ewing sarcoma, uh, discovered by James Ewing in New York in the uh, early 20s, a very similar tumor with a different genetic basis, um, essentially a tumor that has a cure rate of 75% with current methods of chemotherapy. Here's a graph that shows a dramatic improvement in survival from the late 60s, early 70s, where the survival was 30 or 40 percent. Chemotherapy was begun in the late, the late 70s, early 80s when I began my career and doubled the survival from 30 or 40 percent to, to about 75 percent five-year survival. Adults have not uh, benefited to the same extent as children. Children generally have a better prognosis for a similar diagnosis. That's partly because of their youth, their ability to tolerate chemotherapy, and for reasons, the other reasons that we honestly really haven't de defined in the last 20 years. The size of the tumor is still a very important determinant of how a child will do with an osteosarcoma. Here's a very large tumor of the upper arm. Here is that tumor after it's been resected. It's almost 10 or 12 inches in size. It's enormous and involves most of the upper humerus. A child with a very large tumor like that is clearly going to have a very poor prognosis compared to a child with a smaller tumor. Here's a smaller tumor in the same location, another malignancy. It's only about four or five inches in size, and uh, the size of the tumor is an important determinant for the success rate of chemotherapy even today with aggressive treatments. Here's a more typical case of an osteosarcoma, which is a bone-forming tumor in the uh, upper tibia. Here's the knee joint here. This is the distal femur. There is no tumor in the distal femur, and the distal femur is the most common location for osteosarcoma. The second most common location is the proximal tibia. You see this sunburst pattern of bone formation on the front view of this young lady's teenager's tibia. Here's the side view again. Bone is thicker here than it should be normally. Here's the MRI from a front view. It shows a large mass with extension into the soft tissues where the tumor has eaten outside of the bone where it arose into the soft tissues of the tibia. This picture of MRI is a cross-cut picture through the tibia. This is the bone. It's a little bit triangular shaped in this location. You see a big white inflammatory tumor, tumor mass around that bone, which is very typical for a malignant tumor. Here's another example of a shoulder tumor in the upper arm. Uh, this is an MRI as a cross cut. This is the bone. This dark, round, black circle is the bone. The big white circle is uh, tumor tissue that's come out of the bone into the soft tissues with this enormous soft tissue mass that will almost completely shrink away 
with chemotherapy treatment and a good response. Not all children have that good response, but when they do, we know we will probably cure them. Uh, here's a bone scan, an important screening tool. It's a dye uptake in active areas of bone formation. It normally is active in growth plates and the child's normal growth plate here on the right side. Um, there's increased uptake because of the growth plate. Here's the tumor, which is a very large mass in the shoulder. Bone scans are another tool for imaging more subtle tumors. And lastly, here's an osteosarcoma that's making bone. It's uh, three, two or three inches big. It's on the back of the femur. Here's one on the shaft of a humerus. It's a large bone forming tumor. Another example of a bone, bone forming osteosarcoma, which is the typical osteosarcoma. Lastly, here's an example of a tumor that's mostly a soft tissue tumor. We're not talking about soft tissue tumors today, but this is a tumor that sits next to the upper arm. Here's the shoulder. This is the upper humerus. Here's a growth plate in a 16, 17 year old boy. Here's a tumor sitting next, sitting right next to his humerus with a PET scan, which is a labeled glucose scan that goes to areas of high activity. Normally a PET scan shows high activity in the normal patient in their brain, in their heart, and in other normal tissues. If you have an active sarcoma, there's a lot of uptake in that PET scan. It's a very valuable scan for initial diagnoses sometimes, and especially for assessing response to treatment. This PET scan here is a 10 centimeter soft tissue tumor in a thigh. This is the upper left thigh of a 20 year old. It's a very large tumor. It changes quite a bit from its north pole to its south pole. The glucose uptake in this MRI picture, this is the MRI picture. The glucose uptake in the PET scan is here. It usually has a donut, donut like shape with a hole in the middle. The hole is decreased glucose uptake. The black spot is increased glucose uptake, and that uptake will be cut in half with chemotherapy and assures us that the child is getting a good response to chemotherapy in the course of treatment. So PET scans have helped us making a diagnosis when we have a difficult time making a diagnosis on a biopsy, helps us with assessing response to treatment. It's become a very important imaging tool for sarcoma patients, whether they be children or adults. When children have malignant bone tumors and they're under the age of 12 or 14, they still have a lot of growth left in their knee. The knee is the most common location for an osteosarcoma or a Ewing sarcoma, and for most of even the benign bone tumors. Here's a five-year-old with an osteosarcoma just adjacent to her uh, growth plate and her lower femur. This is her knee joint here. This is her lower femur. This is the growth plate, and her tumor is barely an inch away. But with chemotherapy, this tumor will shrink significantly, and today we might even save that growth plate from uh, at the time of the tumor resection and preserve it with a really good response if we had a, uh, the information on a PET scan that justified that. These patients will almost always get some type of limb salvage operation about 90 or 95 percent of the time. They'll either get a big mechanical knee replacing their knee joint. This is the lower femur in a, in a typical mechanical oncologic total knee replacement. This is a bone graft, replaces the same segment of femur. The tumor again is located in the lower femur. This is a pathology specimen of an osteosarcoma that was cut up into little postage stamp size to assess the response to treatment by the pathologist. And this is the section of femur that would be replaced for this particular child which was the case in a child who survived her osteosarcoma at the age of five, but had to deal with a lot of growth issues as the younger children have to deal with uh, surgery for osteosarcoma. Amputations today are reserved almost completely for children that have poor responses or a recurrence of their tumor. And about 90% of the patients can avoid an amputation with osteosarcoma treatment today. Again, the typical choices for Procedures to resect the tumor and reconstruct the leg are a big mechanical knee joint, which have had dramatically improved results in the last 10 years, uh, secondary to some of the research that's been done here and other places looking at those um, implants. If you look at a child, this is a study where we put a Fitbit or a step counter on children with osteosarcoma surgery, and it shows that they function at about two-thirds or three-fourths level of function of a normal child. 
which is actually a surprisingly good level of function given the challenges of, of uh, limb salvage in 20 years ago. It just shows that we've progressed with limb salvage, limb sparing surgery for osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma in children. We deal mostly with uh, the, the challenges of growth and not so much with the challenges of tumor issues because of the effectiveness of chemotherapy. I'll say a few more things about imaging and then I want to say uh, something about the timing of diagnosis because that's a critical, an early diagnosis is really critical for having a good result. Uh, we do have uh, intraoperative navigation for some of the more complicated cases. Here's a tumor in the pelvis and the left hip joint. This is a computer model generated by a CAT scan preoperatively. This is a um, color image of an MRI assessing the intensity of tumor activity. And a, a pelvic osteosarcoma is a far bigger challenge for having an adequate procedure than an osteosarcoma of the lower femur. And we now use intraoperative navigation, which is a computer connection between where we are in the patient's leg and where we are in the patient's imaging that overlaps itself in a computer image in the operating room. It's a technique that we've been working on for the last five or six years that we're pretty enthusiastic about. Here's the last picture of this particular case, which was an osteosarcoma of the pelvis. This is an MRI of the pelvis. This is the left hip joint. This is the normal femoral head with a growth plate. This is the acetabulum or the cup of the hip joint with the tumor in it. This is a PET scan with increased uptake there. This entire section of the pelvis was resected with good margins, which is a big challenge surgically, reconstructed with a total hip and a bone, cadaveric bone transplant, which is routine treatment today for the last 10 years with children with either osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, but a much more challenging surgery and a, and a slightly more challenging prognosis for, for osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. If you look at all the possibilities of what a child can have when they come into your clinic with knee pain, the kids that are most at risk for an osteosarcoma or a Ewing sarcoma are the teenagers who have persistent knee pain. Those kids spend, most of them spend their lives playing sports or being active, and, and an injury from a sport or a various activity is a usual, typical occurrence in most of these children. They need to recover from that injury in a period of time that varies from six weeks to six months. But if a teenager is having persistent knee pain and they're going on without a confident diagnosis beyond six to 12 weeks, that's when a red flag should go up for you as a parent that you need to have some level of confidence about what the diagnosis is on their imaging. And they probably need to have an MRI in addition to their plain x-rays. There are lots of different things that can occur in a children. Trauma can occur. Benign tumors are the tremendous number of benign tumors. Infections can occur, and other types of bone metabolic issues can occur in children. But the one thing that needs a very timely diagnosis is a malignant bone tumor in a teenager. So if you have a teenager that has persistent knee pain and they're six or 12 weeks into their treatment, but there's still some confusion about their plain x-ray, and they haven't had an MRI or been evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon, my biggest advice to you, to you would be to make sure that you have an orthopedic surgeon evaluate your child, that they have a plain x-ray, and that some very serious consideration be given for an MRI, especially at the 12-week mark. If a child continues more than three months with an osteosarcoma, they will be then considered arguably to be a little bit delayed in their diagnosis, and their prognosis will start to deteriorate if their delay in diagnosis continues. It's very important to make a diagnosis or exclude a diagnosis of a bone tumor at the 12-week mark. Here's a child, again, of a 10-year-old uh, child with a picture of the upper arm near the shoulder. This is a very typical sort of picture for a simple bone cyst, um, a very, very benign bone cyst, except that the edges and the borders of this thing are a little bit irregular. An MRI was done on this atypical bone cyst, and it proved to have a very complicated looking picture on their MRI. This child had very subtle shoulder pain. Their pain is not overwhelming. It can be very subtle and still have a malignant bone tumor. The PET scan very quickly confirmed a diagnosis of a Ewing sarcoma. 
If your child is three months into their scenario with pain in a joint, uh, no matter where the location, it's critical that they be evaluated by one of your local orthopedic surgeons. Here's my top 10 rules, sort of my David Letterman top 10 rules for tumor rules that I teach the residents here at Children's and at University of Washington. Kids and adults both present essentially with three kinds of problems that I see in my tumor world. They either have a bone tumor, they have a soft tissue tumor, or they have an abnormal MRI that usually has the last sentence of the report that says, cannot rule out malignant tumor. It's very important that that patient be evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon if they're a child and they have persistent pain. Bone tumors have pain, soft tissue tumors, soft tissue malignancies do not have bone, do not have significant pain typically. The age of the patient identifies the risk of the patient. Teenagers are clearly at greater risk than children who are under 12. And tumor size gets bigger with tumor growth. And the bigger the tumor is, the, the lower their prognosis will be no matter what the diagnosis. The location of the tumor also makes a huge difference. A pelvic tumor and pelvic pain is a far greater challenge for diagnosis and for treatment than a tumor in the extremity. Number four, image to confidence. Every time I see a child in clinic, I label my diagnosis on their plain x-ray with my confidence level. This week I saw two children, both coming in supposedly, one for a malignant tumor, one for a benign tumor. The benign tumor child had a malignant diagnosis. My confidence level was 50-50 on the plain x-ray. The child with a malignant tumor had an infection, did not have a malignant tumor, my confidence level on his plain x-rays was 75%. Both of them got a biopsy the next day. The true diagnosis was reversed. The child with a benign tumor had a malignant tumor. That was how they were sent in to me. The child that was sent in to me with a malignant tumor had a benign problem. It's a very challenging diagnosis. You need to have orthopedic surgeons involved with your child's care. Number five, always biopsy a worrisome lesion before you do any surgery on it. Some of these children and adults will get surgical procedures before they get a biopsy. If it involves anything that suggests a tumor, they need a biopsy first. I'll talk about benign bone tumors in another session, but the benign bone tumors can occur in very difficult locations, and they, then you need to be very careful with their treatment. And I refer to that scenario as benign tumors in a malignant location. High-grade tumors deserve chemotherapy before resection. Sometimes this will be an argument in an older 20-year-old. If they have a malignant tumor, they almost always need to have chemotherapy first. If they're a typical child under the age of 18 or 20, they almost always, close to always as we can get, get chemotherapy before they have a resection of their tumor. Um, always be aware of the challenges of communicating with families and the importance of communicating with families especially with pediatric tumors. I refer to that as the risk of relatives. Be aware of post-operative follow-up. If a patient has a biopsy, they live in Missoula, Montana, it's my obligation to get in touch with that family and make darn sure they know what the final diagnosis is. And lastly, as I said several times before, the only discipline that constantly deals with musculoskeletal issues and is only the, the only true expert for these very challenging diagnoses is your orthopedic surgeon. The vast majority of orthopedic surgeons will refer tumor problems to a tumor expert, but they are a very, very good local resource for you if you have a child or a loved one who has persistent pain without an explanation and no confidence on their imaging. That's the end of my talk on malignant bone tumors. Thanks very much for uh, looking at this. If you have any questions, please contact us. We'd love to give you uh, what we think is uh, reasonable advice for whatever your problem is. Take care.